Kim Begerman and I joined BA at the end of last year, uh, directly after graduating from University of Hertfordshire, where I did a Bachelor's in Management Science with Economics and I also did a year in HM Revenue and Customs, where I was a student operational researcher. And so my role in BA is that uh, I'm an OR consultant and I support the um, airline partners team uh, to make sure that the agreements and relationships we set up with other airlines are beneficial to BA. Um, right, so... Oh, Hi, and I'm uh, Dan Welsh, so I joined BA about four years ago, again through the graduate scheme. Uh, originally I studied at Warwick doing the Morse course, doing the four-year version of that and then going into BA. I've worked in the network planning area which is all around working out where to fly and then also I'm now working in the fleet planning area which is more around working out which planes to buy, uh, how, how many seats to put on them and that kind of thing. Uh, okay, so the agenda for today. So we're going to tell you, uh, we're going to give you a short introduction to BA uh, and uh, Operational research in BA. We're going to tell you what exactly OR does within BA and what kind of approaches we use. And we're going to mention a few developments and challenges that we have in the company. And then we're going to tell you why exactly we recommend working at BA. Uh, so, to give you a short introduction, British Airways is one of the world's oldest airlines and uh, you can trace back its history. Um, well, around uh, 100 years or so. Um, so BA, as of 2011, BA is part of the International Airlines Group along with Spanish Iberia. And we're also part of the One World Alliance, which is one of the three global alliances. Um, so now I actually have a question to the audience. So uh, who can tell me how many million passengers BA carried in 2011? Um, any guesses? There's a price for a little plane for anyone who gets, gets the places. Come on. <laughs> Sorry, 100? 100. I'm, not, I'm asking how many million? 100. No, it's not as many. <laughs> anyone? A bit lower? Seven. No. Nope. No. Nope. Well, it's higher than seven. <laughs> hmm? Forty. He said twenty-one. I think yeah, that's I think, probably the closest. Yeah. So um, the answer is uh, thirty-four. So just to give you a comparison, with so Virgin carried only five million passengers, and uh, EasyJet carried fifty-five. Um. So another question, um, how many destinations do we have? Who is that, sorry? 150. Yeah, I think that's very close. Yeah, well done. Yeah, it's actually 56. <laughs> Where was that, sorry? <laughs> um, and then last question. How many aircraft did we have in service last year? <laughs> 50? No, more than that. 70. 2,000. We wish, no. <laughs> Hundreds, no, more than that. Okay, fine. Yeah, I think that's right. Get a prize for guessing. <laughs> Well, it's actually 245 aircraft. Um, okay, so a bit more about OR. Um, so we are a department of around 50 people, uh, and we sit quite centrally within the organisation in the strategy department. And uh, so we are seen as the internal consultants for the company, and um, so we work on projects that are quite often of a very high profile. Um, then we work really closely with other departments and quite often, so we are expected to be the people who see the links between different departments and how one project can affect things in another department. Um, so we do talk about, we do talk to people from all around BA and uh, listen to their problems and try and find solutions. 
Um, so those 50 people within the department are split into three teams and they are the yield team, they support revenue management area. Then there is the end-to-end -end team uh, who supports strategy and uh, fleet planning and network planning. And then there is the projects team and they pretty much work on the other projects that are not covered by the first two teams. Uh, and within OR we use flexible resourcing, which means that, um, so if, let's say if you're in the yield team, you're not really stuck to working on yield projects, sometimes your the other teams borrow you, so it's good for the company because we can make sure that we focus our resources on the right where the need is, and it's also good for the analyst because you get to experience various areas. Um, Right, yeah, so uh, if you look at this, this is the, uh, oh, yeah, the boarding pass, uh, and this really is a very good representation of the, uh, our team's portfolio, the DOR team's portfolio. So uh, to start with, you've got alliances, so that's the, um, the logo for the One World Alliance that we're in. So oh, I'll do a lot of work with the alliances team to assess uh, what kind of relationships we should have with other airlines, uh, should we go into revenue share agreements, um, that kind of stronger agreements with airlines working closer together to um, sort of to, to make to make a better, better relationship. You've also got customer proposition, which is all around the end-to-end -end customer experience. So looking at the uh, check-in desks, looking at the lounges, uh, all that kind of thing. So we do a lot of work in that kind of area. So, you know, security is there. Are passengers happy with the security uh, checks? Uh, strategy. So the, these are kind of really big, uh, meaty projects step around buying a new batch of planes, how many planes should we buy, what kind of planes should they be, also step around working with the government, so, um, you know, putting pressure on the government around the uh, taxes, around the third runway, all that kind of thing. Uh, revenue management, so this is all around trying to maximise our revenue, so how many tickets should we, put off, should we put on at a cheap price, how many should we put more expensive, what exactly should that price be. So there's a massive kind of optimization um, engine that, that we, we built up to help with that. Ground ops, so this is all around manpower planning, uh, if there's new schemes coming in, um, new working regimes, how is that going to affect the manpower? Do we need, you know, we can model it to see whether we need more manpower, more different working sort of schemes, that kind of thing. You've got your baggage as well, so um, there's a team that, that work with baggage uh, people to to look at how, how can we improve our baggage performance in terms of how to, to stop um, missed bags or to um, to help improve the sort of the speed through the baggage system and also to yeah to look at any any changes that are happening to the design of the baggage system, how is that going to impact that kind of thing. We've also got the website, so we work with the website team to sort of uh, quite a lot of passenger segmentation, so looking at uh, different types of people that visit the website, how do they behave, how can we sort of uh, target them better to, uh, to make them buy upgrades, that kind of thing, and to assess how efficient the website is. You've also got your in-flight customer experience, so this is cabin crew, so we, we, we do stuff around crew rostering, efficient ways of crew rostering, new cabin crew schemes, how is that going to impact uh, the performance. Scheduling, so this is all around looking at the schedule we've got in terms of timings, is it efficient, does it make sense, do we actually have the slots at the airport to, um, to actually land at that time. Network planning, which is all around where we fly, uh, when we fly, how often we fly there, so we've got lots of models that assess, you know, if we change the schedule, how is that going to impact the network, passenger flows, all that kind of stuff. Uh, also loyalty, so looking at uh, how we can target passengers better. So this is all around the, the sort of you know the frequent flyer, the air miles or Avios points as it's now called, and also um, the uh, sort of gold card holders, the very frequent flyers. So trying to target them better. How can we how can we um, keep the business and that, that kind of thing? Uh, finally, brands. So again, we don't we don't do that much directly associated with brand, but obviously all of this kind of stuff. Is, um, is, is coming into in helping to improve the brand, helping to improve the, uh, the view of the customer in terms of us. And we also do, do some stuff around marketing campaigns, assessing the effectiveness of that. So you look at this and there's just every, every single thing here, we've played a part in one way or another in, in it. So it, I think that just really helps to, to show just the, the wide range of work that we do and how much impact we have on the company. Okay. So, uh 
to work in the areas that Dan just described to you, we use uh, various different approaches. Um, problem structuring. I think every single project that we work on requires problem structuring because uh, quite often the initial project briefs that we get are quite vague. So we need to go back to the client and discuss so what exactly they want us to do, are these the right assumptions and so on and so on. Um, spreadsheet modeling. We use a lot of Excel. I think it's, well, it is one of our main tools. Um, so an example project that we've done in Excel is forecasting the demand for um, the lounges at T5. <coughs> uh, optimization, an example could be um, uh, how to allocate aircraft on routes to make sure that uh, we maximize the revenue and uh, what configurations the aircraft should be. Uh, simulation. An example for this could be uh, simulating the passenger flows around the terminal to determine how many uh, check-in desks we need, for example. Uh, statistical analysis, that is, uh, used, that is what often used by the commercial projects team to, um, to see, um, to determine what was the impact of um, a marketing campaign, for example. Kind of, so yeah, passenger segmentation, that kind of stuff, plus yeah. clusters and things like yeah. that. So, uh, using a SAS. Yeah. Um, and forecasting, an example for that would be uh, forecasting the number of runways Heathrow would need by 2050. Um, okay, um, so over the past couple of years, BA have seen quite important uh, developments and also we've been facing quite big challenges. Uh, so as an example, so in 2010, uh, BA teamed up with Spanish flag carrier Iberia and American Airlines to create a revenue share agreement across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it was quite a big deal to us because uh, quite a huge chunk of our revenue is on the transatlantic route. Uh, so by doing this initially we kind of became one company in this market which strengthened our position. Um, so, yeah, then, so, so working, yeah, it meant we could, you know, create schedules together and work really close together um, and really optimise yeah. the, the schedule. Yeah. Uh, so then a year later, we actually merged with Iberia and uh, IAG or International Airlines Group was created. Uh, so earlier this year, the European Commission allowed us to buy BMI. Uh, which was previously owned by Germany's Lufthansa and um, this was really important to us because it gave us additional slots at Heathrow Airport which are generally very scarce so it, this is going to allow us to grow into other markets such as uh, Far East Asia. Uh, July 12th, the Olympic Games, that was a big deal to BA because we were one of the main sponsors and uh, so there was this huge market campaign created around it just to raise the brand awareness. Uh, and last month we actually launched another joint business and this time it's with uh, Japan Airlines or JAL and it is to share revenue between Europe and Japan. So these are all the, oh sorry, one more. Uh, so early next year we're getting our first uh, A380s delivered and also 787 Dreamliners. And uh, so that's very positive news for BA because our fleet is quite old in comparison to other airlines and we're trying to bring the average age down and uh, this is going to help a lot. Uh, these are all the positive things, but then there are also problems that we're facing. So one of them is the economic recession and uh, as you can imagine, so basically not as many people are willing to pay um, premium fares for example and we just need to make sure that we're, uh, our costs are not high and they're actually making profit as a company. Um, so taxes, um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the air passenger duty or APD. It's, so the UK has the highest APD in the world and it has a very negative impact on the <coughs> aviation industry as such in the country. 
And uh, so, for example, people are quite likely to take a train, a Eurostar train to Paris just to fly from Paris instead of flying from Heathrow or anywhere in the UK just because it's cheaper and the taxes are lower. Um, right, yeah. Um, another issue is the, con well, the lack of capacity at airports around London and South East. I'm sure you've all heard about the third runway <coughs> issue and in fact a few of our, all our analysts are working on this and they're doing some uh, forecasting and um, analysis just to, to support the government decision and trying to influence it. Um, so now finally why we recommend working at BA. So one thing is that once you join, you're going to get your first project pretty much immediately. But that might sound quite scary, but it's actually not because you would get quite a lot of support. Um, then aviation is a really fascinating industry and um, it's also a very complex one. And I think uh, BA as a company is really, really complicated. Uh, and people, once they join, they actually stay with BA for a very long time. Um, because what you can do is you can you can move around OR from one team to another, but you can also move around departments. Um, so once you're bored with OR, you can actually go into the business and say work in revenue management, or all of a sudden you decide you want to go into marketing, and you do that. And I don't think there's a single person in BA that understands everything about the company. So you always learn new things even though you've been with BA for, let's say, 30 years already. I think uh, with work, working in OR, because you, cause, yeah, you do move, when you're in OR, you tend to move around teams, so you, you, you may work in one area, gain a good understanding of that area of the business, and then you move to another area and gain a good understanding of that. So you, it's a very good role, because you get a very wide understanding of the whole the whole business, because of the different projects that you work in, which generally a lot of the other people at the company don't get. Um. So uh, there's also a very strong sense of community within OR and uh, I think the working environment is very supportive and uh, motivating and we do hold regular knowledge sharing sessions in forms of uh, knowledge sharing forums or OR lectures um, and then also if you join as a graduate you get uh, assigned a buddy who is just someone you can talk to about work related issues or anything else that you feel should be talked about. Um, also, the OR department has uh, a lot of uh, social events. So, for example, we have these so-called OR games, which is a monthly thing where the three teams compete against each other and then we keep the scores and then at the end of the year one of the team wins and um, yeah, gets a trophy. <laughs> um, so, as BA staff, you would also get relatively cheap flights and lots of other discounts. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm saying relatively cheap because it's uh, it's quite a good deal to well, you get cheap flights when you go long haul, but then within Europe, it's it, it's okay. It's <laughs> this kind yeah, of yeah, so <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, there's some good uh, good deals to be had. So. Um, yeah, so uh, you also get other discounts on car hires or hotels when you go abroad and uh, some other places as well. Um, we have quite a lot of clubs and societies to join. So from football, running, squash to ballroom, dancing, yoga, what, bridge, poker, whatever you want to do, I'm sure that there's a club for it or a society. And, uh, all our de department is actually seen as a very good springboard to management, top management positions. Uh, over here you can see the organisational chart there. So let's say it's me at the bottom there, I'm the OR consultant, then I have my OR manager, then it's Sean Doyle, the head of strategy. Um, so he's not an ex-OR person, uh, he's coming from finance, but to be honest, previously we had uh, an OR person there. But anyway, and then the next person up, Lynn, um, she's actually on the BA board and she comes from OR and she's just one example where a very senior person has an OR background and what it means is that um, they do understand the, the importance of our department and they value our work very highly. 
Yeah, so the, yeah, so it's, it's amazing to so many people you do projects for and then realise that actually they used to work in a while. Yeah. Um, so, uh, right, so at the top you can see the website that you can go to to apply. Um, this year we took on nine new graduates and hopefully next year it will be, well, seven to nine. Similar amount. Yeah, similar amount. Not, not too short sure yet. Um, so we're currently not yet open for applications, but we will be in January. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then it would generally be a case of starting in, in October. Yeah. So, any questions? Are there any questions for? Uh, yeah. Um, yes, as you say, uh, would you please? Uh, explain a little more in detail about the uh, operational research procedure in your company. Uh, uh, for example, for what, uh, say, uh, what, if you decide to buy a new plane of your company, so how can you, how can you make this decision? Um, and another question is for the audiences, of Chi uh, all Chinese audiences, if I do not have the T2 visa, so would you please offer me uh, the, uh, the opportunity to Attend the program in your company. Thank you. Okay. So, do you want me to? Yeah, you can talk about the aircraft. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so the way OR works in the company is we're sort of a consultancy. So we will we will do projects for different parts of the company, uh, and then they they will be the ones that make the final decision on what to do. We will provide them with analytical support um, and you know give them recommendations and everything. But then they are. The they then make the decision themselves. So we're, we're involved in a lot of the decision-making process, but we we are effectively consultants that come in to, to help them make the decision. And, um, yeah. and the visa issue. Um, well, last year we were trying to get two people. One of There was a girl from Russia and a girl from uh, Chile, and uh, the Russian girl, we managed to get her in, but the girl from Chile, we couldn't because there was the visa problem. And this year we're actually, well, I think, yeah, the well we've been told yeah. that if you, have the, you can only apply if you have the right to work and live in the UK. So um, I think it's, yeah, that's generally the case, but at the same time it's not, it's not certain, so... It may still be worth. I wouldn't rule it out completely. If you if you're interested, then by all means go for it. But I think there is, like I say, it's it's likely, unfortunately, that we're we're just currently looking at the EU students. But yeah, hopefully that that doesn't put you off completely. Like I say, there's there's still a chance. So <laughs> yeah, sorry, we can't be more more firm on that. Do you have a question? Yeah. Do you have summer internship program? No, unfortunately, we don't. There's a question at the back there. <coughs> Why do you guys think you are hired or people are more hired than you guys trying to apply to a job? Mm, good question. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I think it's, it's partly sort of, um, so one of the requirements is you sort of have to have some kind of OR background, so either that's you've had quite a lot of OR in your degree or you've done an OR Masters. And I think there's quite a lot involved with um, kind of team working and influencing and those, those kind of skills. That if, if you can show those kind of skills, that they're um, they're quite useful. But yeah, it's a bit of a. <laughs> so the way our recruitment process works is that you have the application form, and then so maybe this year you might get a telephone interview, but it's not definite yet. But anyway, then the next thing is that you're invited to an assessment day. And so, which is a case study and an interview, and then that's it. So, uh, basically, if during your interview you can show the person that you are very enthusiastic about the role and that you have the OR skills, then uh, you're pretty much through. So, I think it's yeah. You sort of um, we tend, we tend, we look at the hard OR skills, the technical stuff, but also at the softer OR skills as well, the sort of problem solving problem. <laughs> I think it varies a lot with what kind of team you go on really because there are some teams that are sort of um, 
simulation specialists and uh, optimization and that kind of thing. Um, so it does vary a bit. What I mean, with me, it's mostly been sort of spread the, the just the analytical kind of mindset and the spreadsheet modeling and that kind of thing. With yeah, with a bit some optimization thrown in maybe, but um, yeah, in the background. But yeah, it's 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 been a lot of kind of. I think it's it's just having that analytical mind, which is, which sort of OR the OR can give you. Yeah. Could you say? Yeah, I have to use specialist software, um, which you can't really learn at uni. So again, I'm just using my general analytical skills, and then I was trained um, to use the software when I joined. But there, there are yeah, there are quite a lot of people that use sort of statistical analysis as well, using SAS and, and that kind of thing. So yeah. it it does it does vary really with what your role is. But yeah, there are certainly a lot of OR techniques being used daily. That's one of the handbook. Do a lot of your graduates that you take on have um, like specialist degrees in their own field? Is that something that you have to research? It's yeah. online, and seven of them had master's degrees, and two of them had the uh, two of them were undergrads. Yeah, so I think. Probably most people have a master's degree, but not everyone. I mean, ni neither of us do have. We we sort of had done undergrad degrees and then gone in. So um, yeah, it's not necessary to have an OR master's. But, I think. but those undergraduate degrees are they specific in OR? Uh, there's the yeah. I mean, mine there was it's not it wasn't just OR, but there's a large OR element to it. Yeah. So it's it's generally yeah. If you do an undergrad degree, then you need sort of a fair amount, a significant amount of it really to be OR. I think it's quite important that you've had at least a few OR modules. Yeah. To so you know the basic techniques that OR analysts <coughs> would use. So yeah, so if, if you've done like a math degree and you've had a few OR modules, then that's good done that, yeah. that good well. I suggest we, we leave it there for now, so we'll we'll head back to the, the exhibition room. Um, those students that turned up kind of halfway through the course. Um, in the exhibition hall, you will need to register before you can get lunch. Um, and we'll start back there at 1:45.